remind all of us what Odysseus said right before he left. Of course, reminding Odysseus as well. Dear woman, I doubt that every Achaean under arms will make it home from Troy all safe and sound. The Trojans, they say, are fine soldiers too, hurling javelins, shooting flights of arrows, charioteers who can win the who can turn the tide like that when the great level or war brings on some deadlock. So I cannot tell if the gods will sell me home again or I'll go down out there on the fields of Troy. But all things here must rest in your control. In other words, he handed over the house to Penelope. Watch over my father and mother in the palace just as now or perhaps a little more. When I am far from home, mentioning the mother reminds us that the mother of course, does die of heartbreak. But once you see the beard on the boy's cheek, you wed the man you like and leave your house behind. So my husband advised me then, now it all comes true. A night will come when a hateful marriage falls, my lot, this cursed life of mine. Zeus has torn away my joy. But there's something else that mortifies me now, she says. Your way is a far cry from the time-honored way of suitors locked in rivalry, striving to win some noble woman, a wealthy man's daughter. They bring in their own calves and lambs to feast the friends of the bride-to-be. Yes, and shower her with gleaming gifts as well. They don't devour the woman's goods scot-free. In other words, Penelope says, if you guys were really serious about wanting to marry one of me, she sets it all up by saying, obviously my son's got a beard, which means it's time for me to, to marry one of you. But none of you have brought me any gifts. We're told then at line uh, 315, staunch Odysseus glowed with, and you might think the next word would be jealousy, but it's not. It's joy to hear all this. His wife's trickery, lurk, luring gifts from her suitors now. Now how Odysseus knows that that's what she's doing, who knows, but he assumes that about her and he assumes that, well, he likes the fact that she's tricky. Let's put it in our notes. Penelope at the end of the Odyssey will mirror Odysseus in many ways for her craftiness. We already know about her weaving and unweaving, right, and all of that. Enchanting their hearts with suave, seductive words, but all the while with something else in mind. This reminds us, of course, of uh, the, the line in Iliad 9 when, uh, when Achilles says, I hate the man who uh, you know, says one thing and keeps another's heart. Odysseus loves that kind of thing, right? And Tinnus will then say, hey, we're not going to leave until you pick one of us, but we will get you gifts. And each one of them goes and gets gifts. And Tinnus' man will bring her a robe. Uh, Eurymachus' man will bring her a necklace. Your Domus's men, uh, man will bring her earrings. Passander will bring her a beautiful choker. Penelope gets all of her gifts. That is to say, her teammate, right? Okay, so she now has her teammate. This is another way you can think about the sacking of Troy. This is the sacking of the suitors, right? And the suitors then were told, dance and sing. Off Penelope goes. And at line 350 and following, Odysseus then will speak to the maids and say, Your master long gone now. Quick now, off you go to the room where your queen and mistress waits. Sit with her. Uh, there and try to lift her spirits. He says, I'm going to trim the torches um, at night. They'll never wear it down with me taking care of them. And then he says at line 361, I have a name for lasting out the worst. It's a great line, right? I, I, I've been through a lot. I can take care of this. Again, Melinda will mock him shamelessly. She will say at line 370, cock of the walk, did someone beat your brains out? Now, mirroring very similar, notice Melanthus, as well as uh, uh, Iris' um, 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 insulting earlier in the book, right? Why not go to bed uh, down on the blacksmith's cozy forge or a public place where tramps collect? Why here blithering on nonstop, bold as brass in the face of all these lords? No fear in your heart? Wine's got to your wits? Or do you always play the fool in battle nonsense? Lost your head, have you, because you drubbed that hobo, Iris? You wait, a better man than Iris will take you on. She's obviously thinking about her level, her her, her level, uh, her lover uh, Eurymachus, right? Iris will take you on. Um, uh, a better man than Iris will take you on. He'll box both sides of your skull with heavy fists and cart you from the palace gushing blood. And Odysseus, we're told at line 380, has had enough with these women. He might take. Uh, he might have have endangered losing his uh, incognito status. He says, "You wait," and then he calls her, "You bitch." The hardened veteran flashed a killing look. We're back to his look again. I'll go straight to the prince with your foul talk. The prince will chop you to pieces here and now. Again, this is forecasting that the suitors are not the only ones who will die at the end of the Odyssey. These women will also die as well. We're told his fury sent the woman, the women fluttering off, scattering down the hall with panic, shaking every limb. They knew he spoke the truth. He then takes up his post by the flaring blazers, sending the fires closely, and it will now be time for Athena to step in to say, um, she meant, uh, to, line 3, 395, she meant to make the anguish cut still deeper into the core of Laertes' son Odysseus. She makes uh, Eurymachus then launch into his first laugh. Um, and he says it, um, at last our torchlight seems to come from the sheen of the man's own head. 
It's not a hair on his bald pate, not a wisp. He makes fun of the fact he's old. He makes fun of the fact that he's bald-headed. This does remind us of that 2 Kings 2.23 passage where Elisha is made fun of by some young boys. And, of course, the bear comes out in a famous story and will destroy all those young boys, right? Same gig going on here. Eurymachus um, will, in fact, taunt him and say, hey, how would you like to come work for me? And then very much like what happens in book 17, line 246 with Milanthus, oh no, you've learned your lazy ways too well. You've got no itch to stick to good hard work. You'd rather go scrounging around the countryside begging for crust to stuff your, greed, stuff your greedy gut. Odysseus will respond at 415 and he'll say, if only the two of us could go man to man in the labors of the field. In other words, he says, I don't work you easy. In the late spring, when the long days come round, out in the meadow, I swinging a well cursed scythe, we test our strengths for work. And he, and he says it. He says, Give me a shield of two spears later at line um, uh, 425. Give me a shield of two spears and a bronze helmet to fit, his, to fit this, shoulder's temple, this uh, soldier's temples, and you'd see me fight from uh, uh, where from front ranks clash. No more mocking this belly of mine, not even enough. You're sick with pride, you brutal fool. And now Odysseus is great with insults, by the way. No doubt you count yourself a great powerful man because you spar with a puny crowd, ill-bred to boot. If only Odysseus came back home and stood right here. In a flash, you'd find those doors broad as they are to cramp for your, for, for your race to safety through the porch. In other words, he says, I'd show you a thing or two. We're told that Eurymachus's fury seethes and he bursts. He says, and bursts. He says, I'll make you pay for your ugly rant at, four, uh, at 440. These, by the way, uh, will be the same words of his lover uh, um, at line 373. Bold as brass in the face of these lords, no fear in your heart. Wine's got to your wits, or do you always play the fool and babble nonsense? Lost your head of you because you drugged the hobo iris. And he then will take the stool and throw it. This is the second time, right? And Odysseus, we're told, will crouch at Amphimius' knees, almost like a supplicant, right? And the, the stool will miss, miss Odysseus, but it's going to hit the wine steward, clipping his right hand. The cup will drop. Clattering along the floor, and flat on his back he goes groaning in the dust. Uh, if you don't mind spoiler alerts, just turn really quickly to Odyssey 22 and read the first 20 lines and be blown away by how this scene sets up the whole idea that when Odysseus jacks these guys, wine's going to get spilt all over the place. And, um, and because of this, um, you're going to have the, uh, the suitors broke into an uproar. There's all kinds of angry outcries. Would to God this drifter had dropped dead anywhere else before he landed here. Then he'd never have lost, uh, lose such pandemonium. It's interesting the word pandemonium gets used uh, as translated by Fagels. The word itself was invented by Milton to describe those demons at the beginning of, of uh, Paradise Lost Book One, an epic that we will get to later. Now we're squabbling over beggars. No more joy in the sumptuous feast. Now riot rules the day. We'll study our Plato's Republic and he will talk about declension of state in book 8 um, and he will talk about how when it becomes that democratic kind of state for Plato, you're going to have all kinds of chaos and, and this is exactly what ha what's happening. Telemachus will then say hey, 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 it's time to go home and go to bed, he says. And, and we're told that the suitors at line 463 they all bit their lips amazed the prince could speak with so much daring and at last Amphimenus will rise and he will say, hands off the strength Stranger and any other servant in King Odysseus's palace. And then he says to the steward, pour us some wine, we'll have a libation, and off everybody will go. And finally, they tip their cups, the final lines of the book, to the blissful gods, and then libation's bed made. They drank the heady wine to their heart's content and went their ways to bed, each suitor to his house. So in other words, we're going to get all the suitors out, and this will obviously set up then what's coming for us. All right, let's turn now to, book, to, to levels two and three really quickly. At 2A for themes message as well, obviously, don't start a fight, right? You probably were told this by an adult in your life. You never start a fight, but if you get into one, you finish it. Obviously, Odysseus is going to fa finish it. Also, this notion of be careful who, um, you, you know, who you pick a fight with, because sometimes, you know, there's that famous saying, don't, you know, don't mess with a sleeping dog, and obviously, Iris learned his lesson in that regards. Let's also point out that another message. Penelope is stuck, right? She'll use what she's got, that is to say, to gain her teammate, right? But notice the major message here is the seductive power of women again, the ability to manipulate these men to get the teammate. And this is a mantra that we have seen again and again in the Odyssey, obviously. 
Another major message here is the power of language. Think about it. Odysseus is way better at insulting than, than uh, the others are. And of course, notice finally the warning to Amphinius, and he will not listen, reminding us somewhat of that story in Greek mythology of Daedalus telling his boy Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun, and the young man cannot hear the old man giving him words of counsel. Sometimes young people know they have, he has the forebodings in his heart, but they just don't get it. At level 2b, the symbolism here, well, the flight, the fight and the jack with Iris, obviously, he's going to prefigure, as we said, book 22. The broken jaw, the inability to speak any more words, it's all, it's all a prefiguration and symbolism. Um, the spilt wine, as we've already said, I mean, all you got to do is just read the opening lines of book 22 to be blown away by that one, right? And, of course, the throne stool... Two times, the first time it's going to hit Odysseus, the second time it's going to miss Odysseus, and the throne still obviously will symbolize the attempt to try to subdue Odysseus, but in the end it isn't going to happen, right? The ironies involved at level 2b, well, notice all of the insults, and Odysseus is far better at it, right, than anybody, than any of the suitors. Notice as well the irony that Odysseus likes how Penelope will work these suitors, manipulate them. He's not jealous. He's almost envious of this. Like, yes, she's just as good as I am at this. At level 3a, well, we are always looking at the Iliad. We mentioned already book 14 and Hera's seduction scene and Penelope's Aristia here. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a fun way to see how those two scenes mirror each other. What is your best or your favorite fight scene in any kind of text, whether it be a book or, or a movie or a video game. Uh, think about Romeo jacking Tybalt in that famous scene from Romeo and Juliet, um, especially the Zeffirelli film version that has a really long fight scene, right? What about Beowulf and his fighting of the three monsters? We will get to that one later. And of course, talk about great fight scenes. We've already seen a bunch of them in the Iliad. We're going to see more of them in Virgil's Aeneid. What's your favorite insult scene? A time when words were better than fists in any kind of text that you're familiar with and it makes you smile to kind of watch or read it and go, yeah, that's, that's a good one. At level 3b, we, uh, by the way, for the insults, we think immediately of Shakespeare and his great insults. He's got, he's got wonderful insults. At level 3b, what's a time that you had to fight and why and what prompted it? And did you have a choice between two options? So, for example, Odysseus has to fight because the loser is not going to be allowed in the hall, and obviously that's a problem for Odysseus. Odysseus has a, he's kind of torn between, on the one hand, really hurting and, and killing Iris, or just kind of jacking him bad enough to get rid of him. What was the time that you had to endure insults? Another question. Or you returned them maybe better, and, you know, um, and, and for that you had a stool thrown at you, metaphorically speaking. Right? What was the time that you worked another person? Or watch someone do it, the way Penelope works these suitors. That's always a fascinating question. Well, speaking of Penelope, we now turn to Book 19 and the moment when Odysseus and Penelope are finally together. And we're going to have another really important recognition scene. By the way, we're going to ask at the end of Book 19. It's a really famous book. Do you think that Penelope understands or knows that the old man she's talking to is in fact her god? Do you? Okay, that's going to be one question. But at the end of Book 19, the old nurse... We, I mean, we're, we're going to have an actual recognition scene, and it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's going to tell us a lot about Odysseus, the way he will respond in that moment of the recognition. I told you, in each one of these recognition scenes, it's fascinating the way that Odysseus will respond, and of course, getting us ready for book 22. Well, we'll get now to book 19 in a second. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the study as much as am I. Thank you.